Now open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Today we're going to be in verses 10 through 19. Acts 9, 10 through 19 says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And there, here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the word made flesh that has come to dwell among us, redeemed us from our sins, and is sanctifying us for your glory. I pray today, Lord, as we examine the scriptures, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Father, I ask that you would guide my tongue and my mind and my thoughts, for my words are useless, but yours, O oh God, have the power to bring life. So I pray that you would use me. I pray that you would direct our hearts and our minds as your word is comes forth, Lord, I pray that it would be like seed that falls on good soil, soil that has been prepared by you, O oh God, that much fruit might come as a result of your word this day. So, Father, I pray that you would watch over your word as you promise to do all that you've sent it to do this day. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the sermon today is Sent. Obedience to Christ's call. Sent is a word that has long floated around in my mind because we are all sent, right? Jesus said, go into all the world, right? We're to proclaim the gospel. We're to make disciples. We're to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're to, we're to make disciples of them. We're to teach them all that the Lord has taught us, right? And, we're to do, and he is with us always in this endeavor. We are sent by Jesus, right? We're to be obedient. Obedience to Christ's call, right? And how do we, how do we do that, right? How can we prepare ourselves for obedience? Christ is going to call upon us, right? He calls upon us in many ways, uh, through many things, through many trials, through many tests. The Word of God is always calling for us, and the Spirit is always moving us. Christ is always calling for us. And I know it is your desire, because you love Christ, to be obedient to His call, right? So what do we do? How can we be prepared for that call? How can we be ready for Christ's call? 
And how can, can we be sure that we're going to respond in obedience? Ultimately, that is the work of God himself. Yet God used human instruments, as he always has. So how can we prepare ourselves to be an obedient servant of Christ, to answer the call that Christ gives us in, an, in, an, in obedience, in faithfulness, so that his purpose may go forth through us, through the instruments he is making us. In Northfield, Massachusetts, on February 5th, 1837, there was a young man who had been formally educated up until about the fifth grade, at which point he went back to work on the family farm. He grew tired of farm life, and he left home at the age of 17 to seek employment in Boston, Massachusetts. And after failing to secure a desirable uh, position in Boston, he asked his uncle, whose name was Samuel, for a job. Reluctantly, Uncle Sam hired this young man to work in his own retail shoe store. However, to keep this young man out of trouble, out of mischief, employment was conditional upon his attendance at the Mount Vernon Congregational Church. At Mount Vernon, this young man became part of the Sunday school class taught by Edward Kimball. On April 21st, 1855, Kimball, moved by the Holy Spirit, called upon by God to go forth and talk to this young man. He went, he visited this shoe store, and he found the young man in the stock room, and there he spoke to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. He shared the love of Christ to this young man. Shortly thereafter, D.L. Moody accepted the love of God and devoted his life to serving him. That's a big name. That is a massive name, right? The following year brought Moody to Chicago with dreams of making a fortune as a shoe salesman. As he achieved success in selling shoes, Moody grew interested more and more in provide, providing a Sunday school class for Chicago's children and the local Young Men's Christian Association. From there, he would go on to infiltrate the YMCA's because it was ready. It was ripe for the picking. Our young men are already there. And from there, his ministry blew up. We're talking one of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century, whose work is still going forth today through the Moody Bible Institute, through Moody Press, influencing the likes of people like Phil Johnson, of grace to you, and even John MacArthur and me. And many of us who have read Moody Press books, right? Fascinating. Fascinating. Many people know the name D.L. Moody and think of the grand and grandeur and the greatness of, of the work that he did on behalf of Christ. But nobody knows the name of Edward Kimball. The man who answered the call. The man who answered the call to go forth and be obedient to the call to share the gospel, to share the good news with this young man whom the Spirit had laid upon his heart. Little did Edward know that the result of his obedience would be thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who would come to Christ through the message of D.L. Moody. God not only calls and sends those who are visibly out in front and publicly known, but also those who support and uphold that work behind the scenes, like the little-known Ananias of Damascus. What we see today is, is there's, there's three characters here, so to speak, in this historical writing, in this, this church history that's before us. There's obviously the Lord Jesus Christ, who is orchestrating all things according to his will. He's orchestrating these things, as we see by he is the source of the visions. He is the source uh, by which all these things are going forth. But we have two people here. We have an Ananias. The scripture turns and focuses on this man, Ananias of Damascus, as well as, the, as Saul, 
who I'll probably often refer to as Paul. Excuse me. He's about to be the Apostle Paul. He's encountered Jesus Christ, right? Same man. So Saul, we see Saul. And as we look at these parallels, as we look at Ananias and, and the call that is before him, and we look at the Apostle Paul of, of Saul of Tarsus and the call that's before him, I want to I want to examine in looking at their lives and looking to the scriptures here before us today. How can we be obedient to the call of Christ as they were obedient to the call of Christ? So the first thing we see today, we'll see three things here. Readiness for Christ's call, a willingness for Christ's call, an expectation of Christ's call. First, the readiness of Christ's call. Look with me at verse uh, 10 through 10. 10 through 12, verse 10. He says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. Reminds me of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Eli is in bed and Samuel hears, Samuel! And Eli jumps up and runs to Eli. Yes, you called. No, I didn't. Go back to bed. Samuel, he runs back in there. Here I am. You called. No, I didn't. Go back to bed. You're driving me crazy, kid. Right? That's how what I would be thinking. Samuel, he runs back in there. Yes, here I am. Oh, Eli finally gets it. Uh, it's the Lord calling you. Next time you hear somebody call, say, yes, Lord, I hear you. Right? Samuel, yes, Lord. It's fascinating. So look at the difference, the contrast between uh, Christ exposing himself, revealing himself to Paul in verse 3. It says, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Scared to death, probably. But here we see a saint. How does a saint respond? seems comfortable it seems like a sweet moment yes lord here i am lord the lord has come to call upon this saint it says that uh he is from damascus now grant you this is not the same ananias from earlier in the book of acts that guy's dead he lied to god he lied to the holy spirit he lied to the saints and him and his wife sapphira dropped dead different ananias ananias means uh God is merciful, and here God is showing his mercy through this, this man. Uh, he says, uh, the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord. It's fascinating that the Lord would come and, and give him a vision, not a dream. He's not sleeping. He's awake. I don't know what this is like because I've never experienced a vision from heaven, but the Lord is audibly speaking to Ananias and earth and sky have fled away and his attention has been completely consumed by the Lord Jesus Christ as he tells him to go, right? And, and how, 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 do we, how can we gather, right? Why, why, why Ananias? What has Ananias done, I guess I should say, to prepare himself for the call of Jesus Christ in this moment? Right? He could have chosen anybody. There's a number of people that Jesus probably could have chosen, but why Ananias? Paul tells us some more about Ananias in chapter 22 of Acts. He's giving his testimony, and, and Paul says in chapter 22, verse 12, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. We learn a lot in that statement. Ananias was a devout man, according to the law, right? Ananias was well known by the outsiders in the city, by the Jews. He was, he was not just popular. He was well known according to his, his dedication to Christ, to, to, to the Lord, to God, right? He's a believer. He's a Christian, and his dedication to Christ comes out of that devotion to the law as a Jew. Now he is a dedicated, devoted man of God. That doesn't happen overnight, right? That, that, that comes about by the reading of Scripture, right? As we, as we are progressively 
sanctified, right? That word just means set apart, sanctified. As we are progressively day by day, as we are in the scripture, we are renewed day by day. We are refreshed day by day. We come to know him a little bit more day by day because we are being washed continually by the word of God and prayer. That's how we grow. That's how we prepare ourselves. That's why Ananias was a suitable uh, uh, instrument to be used by God because he was a devout man. He had studied the scriptures. He knew the word of God. He loved the Lord. He was faithful to the word of God. He was a man of prayer. He spoke to the Lord. It's quite obvious that when the Lord spoke back, he was ready for the call. Yes, Lord, here I am. He wasn't surprised. He wasn't caught off guard, or at least it doesn't seem so, because he was a man of prayer. Because he was a man of prayer. I read this two weeks ago, and I'm going to read it again because it applies. How do we ready ourselves? In the way that Ananias readied himself. And Paul later told Timothy in chapter two, uh, uh, two, 2 Timothy 2.21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel, vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Right? Anyone who cleanses himself, how are we cleansed? through the grace of Christ, but through his word, right? We, we are by the wa pure washing of the word of God, of the water of the word. It washes us, it cleanses us. As we study the scriptures, as we pray, we are cleansed. He will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart. That word means sanctified as holy, useful to the master of house, ready for every good work. Anybody ever recognize or notice that when you're not exactly right with God in the moment that you avoid all these things like reading the scriptures and pray? Right? That, that you've had a selfish moment and, and you, you are in sin and, 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 and that Satan likes to cause us to wallow in that a bit. He wants to stretch that out as long as he can. He wants you ineffective. Right? I, I, I love it that John reminds us, little children, I write these things so that you may not sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the, with, with, with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, right? He is quick and just to forgive us our sins. Satan wants us to wallow in those sins and, and be afraid to come before the mercy of God. He wants us to not forget. He wants to keep reminding us. He wants to keep us in this place where we won't approach the scriptures because of our guilt, where we won't approach the Lord in prayer because of our guilt. But Jesus says, I'm quick and just to forgive. And when we are walking in that manner, we are in the moment not suitable for use. And Satan would love to keep us in that place. He would love to keep us from the scriptures. He would love to keep us from prayer, from repentance, because we're of no effect. In order to be obedient to the call of Christ, we must ready ourselves, right? We ready ourselves as Ananias did. He was prepared. He was a devout man in good position amongst the people of God. He was versed in the scriptures. He was up on his prayers. And when the Lord called, he was ready. So we should be ready. We should ready ourselves day by day as we pray, as we seek forgiveness and repentance, as we are met with the word of God, as the word of God uh, either comes into us through reading or remind, or we are reminded by the spirit of the word of God. We must repent, turn to Christ, and be cleansed that we may be a suitable vessel for use. He goes on to say, uh, And the Lord said to Ananias, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Fascinating. We have like a double vision thing going here, right? Showing that God is orchestrating all this. 
right? Christ is orchestrating all this, right? So Ananias gets this vision from the Lord, and in this vision, he hears of a vision that the Lord has given to this other man who he's called to go to. It's like, I wish it worked that way for us, you know? It's, it should work that way for us sometimes. We're so un, you know. This this is I'll remind you, uh, 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 and not a normal act, right? There's not another account like this. I don't know of anybody else whom the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven was the one who initiated the salvation face to face, audibly. Paul saw Jesus Christ, right? Commissioned as apostle uh, by Jesus Christ Himself, right? He tells Ananias, go. There's the call. Ananias, I want you to go, right? As we are called to go in whatever way that looks like, right? We're called to go. He says that he's praying, right? This man is, is praying. This must be a, a strange thought because Ananias does not know that, that Jesus Christ has shone down on Paul on the road to Damascus and this great light and has left him trembling and left him blind. Well, he's actually about to find that out because he's going to regain his sight, right? But there's not a lot of detail here. It's just, uh, Ananias, I want you to go. For behold, this Saul of Tarsus, he's praying and he's seen a vision of you coming in to lay his hands on him that he may regain his sight. I can't imagine what's going through Ananias's head, right? I can't imagine what's going through Ananias's head. So we see that Ananias was prepared. He was ready for the call. He was ready for the call as a devout saint. And here, what do we see Paul doing as he is waiting? Right? He's fasting and he's praying. Verse 9 said that he is he, he went three days, uh, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. He's fasting. He's praying. And I can't imagine what's going through Saul's mind. Not only because he just saw the risen Christ, whom said, you're persecuting me. But I wonder in this moment if he wasn't remembering back to the Passover, where he was one of the ones shouting, crucify him. I have to wonder in this moment if Saul was not reflecting back to a short time ago when Stephen stood up and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ with, pre with precision and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul called for his stoning and approved of his stoning as those men who stoned him laid their garments at his own feet. He can see nothing. All he's been told to this point is you are persecuting me. Now you've seen me and you're blind. Go to town and I'll tell you what to do next. Certainly, he's been converted at this point. He has seen Christ. He has come face to face with his sin, and he is absolutely sorry for his sin. He has met Christ, but he's given nothing else, right? This is a unique circumstance. Again, um, we hear the gospel, and the Holy Spirit works within us, and we are caused to be born again to a living hope. For Paul, it was a little different. Jesus, the risen Lord, ministered to Paul, come face to face with Paul. He was called directly by Christ. So I don't know what's going through his mind, but it's got to be turmoil. And so he does what only the Spirit can do in a young believer. He begins to pray, right? He is praying. He's praying. He's doing the most natural thing a believer can do. Right? Anybody struggle with prayer? It's, it's funny that when we are first born again, when Christ first saves us, prayer becomes so natural. It's such a gracious gift, just the ability to pray. Genuine prayer. We have met the living God. We're excited and we're talking to Jesus like he is our best friend right next to us. 
And then somewhere along the way, we lose track of that. And then as we grow mature, our prayer life grows once again. It's like there's this adolescent period of our Christian walk where it seems to me where it doesn't seem no so natural, but look, it's such a natural thing. He's waiting upon the Lord. And so how is Paul preparing for the call of God? He does so by praying. Jesus did the same thing. In preparation to preach in Galilee, Mark 1.35 says, And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. If we're going to ready ourselves for the call of Christ, we must pray as Jesus prayed. Ephesians 6, 18 told us that praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all the saints. Right. And so that's what Paul does. He resorts to the most natural thing a believer can do, and that is to pray. I love how Spurgeon, what Spurgeon says concerning prayer, that prayer is the autograph of the Holy Ghost upon the renewed heart. It's all Paul knows, right? Granted, Paul's a very sharp individual, right? I'm sure he's connecting dots in his mind at this point, right? But what is he driven to? prayer he's driven to prayer if we are going to be if we are going to prepare ourselves if we are going to to uh, ready ourselves for the call of christ no matter what that is maybe that call is is for you as a as a parent to discipline and or instruct a child that that's out of sorts and you've 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 not been doing that and you know that the lord is working with you in that and you need to address some things Maybe that's the call of God at the moment for you. Maybe it's a, a hard discussion with a spouse that needs to take place and the Lord would be working on you to, to do that. Maybe that's the call. Maybe the call is uh, something great. Maybe the call is to go to the mission field or to be a, a pastor. Regardless of the size of the call or what the call is, maybe the call is to talk more about Jesus. Right? Right? The, the, the people of, of, of God in the Old Testament were to be a light to the nations, an example to the nations of godliness. And that has been, now the church has that role. We have the role of being a light to the world, right? Not, not a, a lamp hitting under a basket, but set up high so that it gives light to the whole house. We're to be a, a city on a hill, Right? The gospel, the good news, the, 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 the scriptures as a whole is, gives us a framework of, uh, gives us a worldview that is biblical. And that biblical worldview as we share it and as we talk about it and discuss it in conversation brings light to those around us. And hopefully it would bring opportunity to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in those conversations. Maybe that's the call for you. Regardless of the call, we can ready ourselves by remaining in prayer, by cleansing ourselves, by walking with Christ daily, right? Prayer is important. Spurgeon also said that I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach because there's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. Prayer is the right response to the uncertainties in this life. Second, the willingness for Christ's call. He says, But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. I would be a little concerned myself, right? Hey, you know that 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 guy who got letters from the chief priest to come and put all y'all in prison? Yeah, I want you to go down to the street called Straight and I want you to pr pray for him. Right? He'll be waiting on you. What? <laughs> you want me to do what? Uh, Lord, this guy. Yeah. 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 Right. It's okay to be concerned. It's okay to be concerned. Um, Safety is not always a guarantee, right? 
uh, Christ surely uh, guards us and keeps us and keeps us safe in many circumstances, but it's not always a certainty, right? Sometimes it's seemingly risky, but God has a sovereign plan in it. This was seemingly risky, though everything went okay, right? You, you want me to go to that man who just killed our brother Stephen, right? He's not so much questioning God. He's making a comment that, that addresses his concern, right? That addresses his concern. He's concerned about the past evil, right? And in the path of obedience, there will be concerns. There will be some things that we will have concerns about. We have all kinds of what ifs in our life, don't we? What if? What if this? What if that? We try to play out these things ahead of time in our head instead of just answering the call and say, yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll trust you. Because that's what it boils down to is trust, right? He has concerns for past evil. Notice he, he, didn't, he didn't say he wasn't going to go. He just voiced a concern, right? He's, he's not in sin. He just voiced a concern. He's not like Jonah, who God commanded to go to Nineveh and, and, and to, to warn them that if they don't repent, he's going to destroy them, right? What did Jonah do? He went the opposite way. No, Lord, I will not, right? That's not what's going on here. He's not like Jonah, right? It's more like Jesus in the garden. <laughs> and Jesus can sympathize with us, right? Because he's been tempted every way, as we have been tempted yet without sin, as Hebrew tells us. Luke twenty two forty one through 45, And Jesus withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Different circumstance, for sure. Jesus was staring into the cup of God's wrath that was about to be poured out on him, that was the full weight of all our sins who would believe upon him. That was that weighty cup, right? A bit different. But we see even Jesus saying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not, not my will, but yours be done. Oh God, here we see him, Ananias, just saying, Jesus, now this is the man who is dragging us off to prison, right? Trying to kill us. You, you realize that, right? You realize that, right? Look at, Look at what Jesus says. He says, uh, he says, and, uh, uh, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Go, go, go. That's the call. This is a, this is a key verse. It's a key verse in that he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And what would Paul go forth and do in the rest of the book of Acts? He would go forth carrying the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. Everywhere he went, he went to the synagogue first. And then he went out into the streets to the Gentiles and ultimately wound up before Agrippa. He proclaimed the truth to the children of Israel, to kings and to Gentiles. This is a driving text from here forth. He will, he will go forth and carry my name. He says he will be shown how much he must suffer. It's fascinating, right? For many of us, um, for many of us, the call will not be one that would take our life, right? Maybe suffer persecution verbally, 
uh, may, maybe be thought ill of according to the world's standards, right? But some have a higher call. Paul had a higher call call. He said, I'm going to show him how much he must suffer. Paul has caused much suffering to the Christians up till this point, and all that he has caused them to suffer, he will suffer, including martyrdom. He will be killed, right? I said, I will show him how much he has to suffer. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four through 28 tells us, Paul tells us, five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And again, he would go on to be martyred. Right? But he's willing. Right? We see the willingness of Ananias. Ananias, despite the fact that that this man is somebody who has been uh, dragging Christians off to to prison, right? Or even pushing for their execution. His willingness is greater than his fear. His willingness is, is greater than his reservations. And we see with the Apostle Paul all that he would eventually go through, but he was a willing vessel, right? whom God made willing, right? Who God worked in and through to bring us the word of God, right? We have much of the New Testament because of the work, right? And seemingly great or small, we must be willing. Look, it, 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 we need more Edward Kimballs. We need more Ananiases, right? You might reach one individual. We talked about this in Sunday school. You might reach one individual with the good news of Jesus Christ in your entire life. But who knows what the Lord will do through that one individual. As, as, as this Ananias, who is unheard of elsewhere in the scripture, this is the only place in Paul's reference to him in Acts chapter 22. It was just the one notable thing. This guy would be called upon by God to disciple the apostle Paul to go to the Apostle Paul in obedience, lay his hands on him and pray for him, to witness him being filled with the Holy Spirit, to s- remain with him, to break bread with him, to, to, to disciple him for a short period of time that would last for an eternity. Nothing you have that you will do for Christ will ever be lost. Nothing you will ever do for When you are called upon by the Lord Jesus Christ, it will never be lost, right? The, the, the things that we try to do for ourselves in this life, right? We're, we're, we're caught up often in our own world, in our own life, and the things that we want to do. And it's hard to be willing to, to do what Christ is calling us to do when we're so focused on the things of this world. But the things that we are building in this world are temporal and fleeting and will fall. The things that are, I love, uh, caps, forgot his first initials, Uh, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last, right? The lasting things are those things which Christ has called us to, whether great or small. Are we willing? Are we willing to answer the call of Christ no matter what that is? Are we ready to respond to the still small voice that is obviously in line with the word of God, with what the Holy Spirit is working in us, the call of God, whatever that may be, however that may be, are we willing, right? The call of Jesus in our lives, Luke 9, 23, and Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
Is that not what we see here with Ananias? Considering himself nothing, right? Denying himself, taking up the cross and whatever may come of following Jesus and following him and being obedient to him. We see the same thing with Apostle Paul who has denied himself his whole life, taking up his own cross so that the gospel could make it from generation to generation to us as we discussed in Sunday school. Right? And last and most gloriously, the expectation of Christ's call It's amazing how what God is doing here through dual visions, he brings Ananias to Paul. He says, So 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 Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit, right? Two visions, one Lord. The result of obedience in this story is genuine Christian fellowship. Genuine Christian fellowship, I love it. A.W. Tozer says that true faith is never found alone. It is always a found accompanied by expectation. What is the expectation of Christ's call? in our minds, and our hearts. The man who believes the promises of God expects to see them fulfilled. Where there is no expectation, there is no faith. We have to trust the Lord in these endeavors. When Christ calls, we must trust that he is faithful, right? He has a plan in the call that he has for us, right? And what has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ led to in this account? Look how he addresses Saul. Brother Saul. I love that. Right? He comes in. He comes in. All he knows is that Jesus had, a, had given Paul, Saul a vision of Ananias and that he is praying, right? Which only happens when you're a born again believer. Genuine prayer is only for those who are born-again believers. He is praying, Jesus says, and he says, Brother Saul, and Agnias uh, expresses his faith in the words of Christ by calling Saul his brother, right? He, he, he's, he's, he's gone in faith. He's gone with expectation. God has called me to go and to lay my hands on this man, And so I'm going to go in expectation that God is going to do an amazing work. And God does. He calls him brother, right? He says, uh, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight. Fascinating, right? He's received a vision of Ananias coming in to lay his hands on him. And now Ananias comes in and say, hey, you had a vision from Christ on the road on your way in, and I've come to lay my hands on you. Oh, right? What an amazing work that Christ has done here, uh, orchestrating this work, this salvation. And we know that Christ works all things according to, to, to his will, right? He works all things according to, he's always at work in all these things. Here we get to see it set out for us, right? He says uh, he is healed of his blindness. Right now, now we know that this is a physical blindness, that when the light shone down upon him, when Jesus spoke to him, that the great light that has shone upon him has caused him to be blind. And I don't know if you've ever stared at a bright light for a minute. And, oh, right? This is a bright light. <laughs> it's the light of Christ has shone on him. And he has been blinded. It has been three days. In these three days, he has been uh, filled with prayer and fasting, waiting upon the one whom the Lord would send. And the one whom the Lord would send is Ananias. And he comes in, lays his hands on him, that he may be healed of his blindness. There's an awesome spiritual element here. And that is the fact that we all are in need to be healed of a spiritual blindness, 
right? If you have come to Christ, your eyes have been opened as Paul's were opened. Praise God. But there are many in need of a messenger who would come and bring the good news of the gospel that their eyes may be opened, right? John 3, 3, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God, lest he be born again, lest something happen, unless God intervene, unless God produce salvation in the, in the being. He cannot see the kingdom of God. He's blind. He's in need of a miracle, just like Paul here, right? Further down on there, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not have perished but have eternal life. The good news of Jesus, Paul no doubt heard, right? We know he heard it. We, we know he heard it a lot, probably. In fact, he was sick of hearing it. It disgusted him. He wanted the people to die who were proclaiming it. He heard Stephen preach it, right? Right? He just never saw his own sin until Jesus confronted him. And Jesus did confront him. Jesus blinded him. But now his eyes have been opened by Christ. He, is, he can see. Not only physically can he now see as the scales fall from his eyes. But he can see the kingdom of God. Right? It says that he was filled with the Spirit. Right? He was filled with the Spirit. Right? We, we need to... We, we, we need to, uh, we all need to be filled with the Spirit, right? We're given the Spirit. It is the Spirit that makes us alive. It, the, the Holy Spirit is what delivers the grace and the faith to be saved in the first place. Paul had the Spirit. The Spirit caused him to be born again to a living hope as it is with all of us, right? He was had the Holy Spirit as he was sitting there blind, praying to the Lord, waiting on Ananias to come or else he wouldn't have been praying, Right. So what does it mean that now he is filled with the spirit? It was not like Acts chapter two, where the Holy Spirit dis must descend. It's not like going to be in chapter 10 when 10, when the Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles. It's. He's filled with the spirit. He already bore the spirit. Now he's filled. And we saw this, if you remember, in Ephesians chapter five, in Ephesians chapter five, uh, Starting in verse 18, he said, uh, 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 be filled with the spirit and do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Right in that word uh, properly translated means uh, be being kept filled, be being kept filled. Right. And we are being kept filled as we are, as I said in the beginning, remaining in the word, remaining in prayer, as we are seeking Christ, as we are putting away the things of the flesh and embracing the things of Christ. He would go on to say, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And what does the Holy Spirit do as, he, as we are filled? What does that produce? He goes on to tell us. It, it, it produces wives that, that submit to their husbands and husbands that love their wives as Christ loved the church and died for it, gave himself up for her as they wash her in the pure water of the word. Being filled with the Spirit looks like parents who are, are, or are raising their children in the admonition of the Lord. It looks like children who are honoring their parents and being obedient to their parents. Being filled with the Spirit looks like a, a master or an employer who is caring for his employee, for his servants, and servants who are working hard for their masters in, honest, in honesty. Being filled with the Spirit is being less of us and more of Him. It's putting off the old self as we saw in Ephesians and putting on the new man and being renewed day by day in prayer and through His Word. 
right? Which leads to the last thing, baptism and fellowship, it says. He says, um, And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. Right? That is the proper response to saving faith that comes to us as a gift from God. Right? It is an outward uh, uh, expression of what has happened on the inner man. And we do that in obedience to Christ. And it says, taking food, he was strengthened. This is the expectation fellowship with the saints. Taking food, he was strengthened. He had not eaten. He was fasting. And now he is not eating alone. Now he is brought into the household of God, to the family of God, as he takes bread and is strengthened. Right? Anytime we take bread, we break bread together, it represents fellowship. Paul, Saul is now a brother in Christ. The one who was, who was seeking to ravage the church, the one who was breathing threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord is now breaking bread with these saints and a part of the fellowship. That's the power of Christ. Let us be. Let us consider the call of God, whatever that may be in our lives, right? Maybe you'll be a, maybe you'll be a D.L. Moody someday. Maybe you'll just be an Edward Kimball. I hope you're an Edward Kimball. I, I hope you're an Ananias, right? There's nothing that you do that is lost to God. Every little thing God can work for greatness in his kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that I pray that you would use us, O oh God. That as, as that as Ananias was made ready by your spirit, Lord, as he sent was sanctified through continual daily Maybe what seemed mundane to him, but those daily activities of searching the scriptures and prayer, the daily mundane things seemingly that, that he went through to become the devout man that he was, well respected by those around him, those small daily practices prepared him for the great call to go to who would become the Apostle Paul. Lord, thank you for his obedience. And I pray that we would be obedient in the same way, Lord, that we would be sensitive to the Spirit at work within us, uh, that, 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 that we would be readied for the call, Lord, that we would be willing to go, Lord, regardless of what the circumstance might be, that when you impress upon us to go, no matter what that call may be, Lord, I pray that you would make us willing. And I pray that you would cause us to go in faith expecting the fellowship of saints to increase. Or our fellowship to increase in love. Father, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.